kind of comes all together because it's, it's coming to a, a fulfillment, a culmination. We are at Caiaphas' house. And, you know, only recently, in the last few years, did they actually discover an ossuary in, in here, in Jerusalem, that had the name Joseph Caiaphas on it, where his bones were. Only recently was the evidence of him. Uh, we were, well, actually, if you look down this way, you can't see it from below the porch, but, but down here is an ancient road, a road from the time of Messiah. And this would have been the road that he would have walked up because this goes down to the Kidron Valley, and then right from the bottom of that road, you see the Garden of Gethsemane. So we go from what, where we were last night, remember that awesome time, that the Garden of Gethsemane, this kind of follows exactly to the next step. He was here, he was there at night, and he was taken here to Caiaphas' house. And I'm going to start by reading the account. I'm reading from Matthew. And starting where we were at the end, Garden of Gethsemane, it says, While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priest here, and the elders of the people. And then it goes on with a betrayal. And then it says they took him, and it says they all, all the disciples deserted him and fled. Okay, we move forward. Those who had arrested Yeshua, Jesus, took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Yeshua. Not even a single, to a single charge to the great wonder of the governor. 
Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, or Baraba or Yeshua, who is called Mashiach, Messiah. For he knew it was out of envy they had handed him over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, don't have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then? With Yeshua, who is called Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. They shouted the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but then said an uproar was starting, he took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood. He said, it's your responsibility. The people answered, let his blood be upon us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium, gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns, set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, he said. They spit on him. They, they took the staff, struck him on the head again and again. They mocked him. After they, they had done that, they took the robe, put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. And as they were going out, they met a man named Cyrene, named Simon of Cyrene, named Shimon, Simon. They forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which, in, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Yeshua wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Yeshua, Melech Yehudim, the king of the Jews. The two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Ben Elohim, the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said. Let him save it. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Yeshua cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing around heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes down to save him. When Yeshua had cried out again in a loud voice, and he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. We'll stop there. Because the next stop is the garden tomb. Messiah is taken across the Kidron Valley, the Valley of Tears, brought here to the house of, the Ca of Caiaphas, the high priest, and the Sanhedrin, the chief priests of the people. There he is put on trial, there he is falsely accused, and here he is sentenced to death. Now there is a way that the sacrifice of Israel had to be offered up, and they came in a sacred procession. And the first part of that offering up the sacrifice is called the hikriv. It means the bringing near of the sacrifice. There was a sacred bringing near of the sacrifice to the priest and the priest to the altar called the hikriv. So the sacrifice that you offer up, you had to give to the priest. The, the sacrifice had to come into the possession of the priest. So Messiah is the sacrifice. Why was he brought here? Because here are the priests. The sacrifice has to be brought into the, the jurisdiction of the priest. And so even though you see, you see the, the evil of man in this, it is also sacred. God is sovereign over the whole thing. 
It's the priest that must offer up the sacrifice. It's the high priest that must offer up the highest sacrifice. So he is brought into the possession of the priest that is the hikriv. But then the next part is called, the next part of the sacrifice is called the samach. Actually, try it. Samach. The samach is this. When those who offer up the sacrifice have to lay their hands on the sacrifice, it's called the samach. And when they do that, they are they touch the head of the sacrifice, and they it's a sacred touching. When they do that, they are identifying with the sacrifice. Because when the sacrifice is offered up, he's offered up for the person offering it up. So therefore, the, you lay your hands on the sacrifice, and you identify with the sacrifice. At that moment, you and the sacrifice become one. On the day, on, on Yom Kippur, the high priest puts his head on the sacrifice, touches the head, and confesses the his sins of the people over the sacrifice. So what happens here? Not only is he brought to the priest, but what it says is, after they accuse him, after they find him guilty, it says they strike him. They put their hands to his head. They are, it is the, even though it, it is evil and sinful, yet God is sovereign over it. That is the Samach. They must, the priest must touch the head of the sacrifice. They do so, and then on the holiest day of the year, it is only one priest who offers up the sacrifice. That's why Messiah was brought not just to the priest, but to the high priest. And even though the high priest was corrupt, that's all part of it. In fact, even the Talmud, even the rabbinic writings say they speak of this house, Caiaphas and Annas, being corrupt. They called it the house of whispering. In other words, intrigue going on here. And you know, an interesting thing, because we, we, we have Peter here and we have Caiaphas. In Hebrew, their name, Peter's name is, they called him Cephas, it's really Kepha. And Caiaphas was Kepha. It's almost an identical name, the two of them. And so here what happens, the high priest has to be involved with offering up the sacrifice. On the day of atonement, the holiest day, the high priest takes two goats, and he stands in front of the people, and one goat... One go to his right, one go to his left. He takes an urn in which are two lots. One says on it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, says Ladonai, or to the Lord. That will be the sacrifice, Yom Kippur. The other one says Lazazel, or the scapegoat. He takes it up, he lifts it, he puts one on the head of one, one on the head of the other. One becomes the sacrifice goat, the other becomes the scapegoat. And so there's two, and they have to look pretty much identical. What happens 2,000 years ago? Messiah is then presented in front of the people. One man here, one man here. As there were two goats, there are two men. One Messiah, the other Barabbas. Interesting, in the, in the, in the ancient ritual, the two goats had to be identical. Interesting because Barabbas means son of the father. They two, they stand Barabbas. Bar Abba. And so they are standing together, and then one is chosen, one become, one escape, one goes, and the other one becomes the sacrifice. And then what happens there? It says then the Romans, now the Romans represent, you know, the, the, the priests represent Israel, but the Romans represent the world, the nations, the Gentiles. Then they perform the Samach, they strike him on the head. In the same way they touch his head, the Samach, and they also sentence him to death. The scapegoat, actually, well, one other thing here, is when that, when this, when that, that samach is being performed, what happens is also, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest pronounces the sins onto the scapegoat. And so what happens when Messiah is here, and the high priest and the, the council, when they, what, they don't just are gonna strike him, they pronounce sin over him. They call him a blasphemer, and upon that charge of blasphemy, he will be offered up, like the sacrifice. But the principle, what it said, the mystery says, that what they confess over him is their own sins. So when they call him a blasphemer, they are the blasphemers. Man is the blasphemer, because they are, man is making himself as God, judging God. That's the sin of man. You shall be as God, and now they're doing it and judging God. Blasphemy. It is, a, but it's all. They represent all. They represent Israel and the world. And so, also the Romans. Why do they crucify him on the charge of treason?
But that's their sin because he makes himself out to be king. Well, that's what Rome did. There's only one king. And so he is struck. He is taken outside. You know, when, the, when on Yom Kippur, because Messiah is actually both the sacrifice and the scapegoat in the end, the scapegoat would go up to the Mount of Olives. They would, they would lead him there, and they would lead him to a man who they said, they would said that it would be a Gentile because it was unclean to take an answer. So they lead, Messiah is led to the Gentiles. And Pilate, a man who stands in readiness. And actually, when they finish dealing with the scapegoat, or the, actually all the Yom Kippur things, the last thing is washing, washing, washing everything off. The priest, and so Pilate washes his hands. The scapegoat, what happens? When the scapegoat is chosen, and also when the, when, the, when the sacrifice is chosen, a scarlet cord at the time of Messiah was placed on them, one on its throat, around its throat, and the other around its horn. And so here, what happens when Messiah is judged, what happens? It says in one of the accounts, they put a robe on, a scarlet robe on him. He is the scapegoat. And so they lead him, and they lead him outside the camp, and it says that about the scapegoat, it says that when he's taken, he's taken to a land. In Hebrew, it's called Gezara. It means a land cut off, a land that you cannot inhabit. In other words, when the sins are going there, you cannot visit it anymore. You cannot inhabit it. Nobody can go to see the scapegoat. And to make sure that that scapegoat would never come back, just this is just at the time of the Second Temple, even though they were just supposed to release it, they want to make sure it never, they kind of pushed it off a cliff to make sure it would never come up. But the point is that it is cut off, it is gone. It is gone. And so 2,000 years ago, and just as remember the scapegoat, remember what we saw yesterday, is that on the Temple Mount, is this east-west thing. The scapegoat goes from, from the, the west to the east, as far as, that's the, the direction of infinity. As far as, your, as the east is from the west, your sins are gone. And then something else, in the days of the rabbis, the rabbis wrote something amazing. I shared one of them on the Temple Mount, but something else. The rabbis record that when that scarlet, when they did that scarlet thread on the sacrifice and on the scapegoat, they took a piece of it and, and attached it to the temple doors. And it said every year on Yom Kippur, they would read the scripture, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And the rabbis record that when, they, when, the, when Yom Kippur was over, when they did this, that scarlet thread would turn from scarlet to white, symbolizing their sins were gone. But the rabbis record that something happened to Yom Kippur. A cosmic change happened because it affected Yom Kippur, the holiest day. What they said was this. All of a sudden, that scarlet thread stopped turning white. When did it happen? The rabbis give the time. It says about 40 years from the temple's destruction. That comes to just about the year 30 AD. A cosmic change. In other words, the sacrifices were no longer the way to do it. Because, And the Bible gives the answer because the final atonement came. Messiah, our scapegoat. Messiah, our atonement. Messiah who is the fulfillment. There is nothing like this in history. Even the rabbis are bearing witness of it without realizing it. An amazing thing. No matter how anyone tries to explain it, there is no way to explain away what the prophet Isaiah wrote 700 years before this happened. And even the rabbis in ancient times said, this is Messiah. He said, who has believed our report, Isaiah? And to whom has the arm of the Lord, the Zoroah, the power of God, been revealed to us? For he grew up as a tender shoot, as a root out of dry ground. He has no great appearance for, to attract us to us or, or that we should be drawn to him, no majesty. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hide their face, so we esteemed him as despised, struck of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us shalom fell upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All of us, have, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord, Adonai, laid 
put the, the, the iniquity of us all, the punishment of us all to fall upon him. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before her shearers is, is silent. So he was silent. He didn't open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? Yet there was no deceit found in his mouth, no violence. Yet, with a rich man in his death, he made his grave among sinners. But it was the Lord's will to crush him if he would make his life a guilt offering and a sham. Isaiah 53. He made intercession for the transgressors. He justified the many. There is no, nothing like this on earth. There is only one Messiah. There is only one who answered this. Even the rabbis, when they looked at this, they said, well, that is the Messiah who suffers, but there's only one person in human history who fulfills this. Only one. There's not even a number two. There's not a runner-up. Only Yeshua of Nazareth, Messiah, Jesus, Rabbi, Prince of Peace, Lamb of God. This is real. This is real. I mean, who could have put this together but God? And here this one who dies on the cross becomes the center of human history without, without a weapon, without power, without riches, without armies. He becomes more powerful than any force or government or parliament on earth. Who could have done that but God? The power of the cross. It is real. Somebody died for you. Somebody died for me. We have God as our price. And this is real. As real as that is real that in the end there is an eternity and we are made for eternity and there is heaven and there is hell. And this place, in the same way, this place, where exactly is a question, but the fact is, whatever we feel or don't feel, he was here. We said it from Gethsemane in the same way, no matter what we, how we are doing or not doing, God's love doesn't change. We do not change the love of God. No sin we, we commit changes the love of God. But God's love is to change everything. It doesn't matter how far you feel from God. It doesn't matter your good days or bad days. That doesn't change what he did here. It doesn't change the blood of God. That is real. So much so that we are to be affected by it, that it touches us. You know, no matter what we are feeling, God is real and God is love. The love of, you will never change the love of God. I will never change the love of God. Nothing. And in fact, even this place is about that. You know, you had Peter... Or Shimon, Kepha, and you had Judas or Yehuda. Both of them sinned. Judas sinned by betraying the Lord. Peter sinned by denying the Lord. Now the thing is, if Peter, I'm not getting into sovereignty, but if Peter had repented, he would have been saved. I'm sorry, he was saved. No, no. Oh, that's good. Good news. Hey, Peter's okay. <laughs> If Judas had repented, he could have been saved. God knew he wouldn't, but if he did, he would have. And, we, and if Peter had been filled with so much regret that he just was so overcome by it, and he never came back, we may never have known. He would have been the disciple who left. And we wouldn't have had a book of Peter. We'd have a book of Judas. The point is, you know, that God is not of regret. Paul said, "He doesn't. It's, regret is not of God. Repentance is. Sorrow and then repentance and then rejoice and move on in God. That's what it says. It's not about, it's, this walk is not about ne never messing up. It's about what happens after you do. Because this is not the first covenant. This is the second covenant that was made after the broken one. So God, so the new covenant is always new. It's the covenant of the second chance and the second chance again and again and again. And here it, here it is, this courtyard. Here we are in the courtyard, similar, uh, uh, actually memorializing Peter's sin. Peter in Galakantu, this statue, look at this statue. 
This statue is in commemoration of the sin and messing up of Peter. Right there, he's denying the Lord. And it's a statue. This place, imagine if Peter came back. Imagine if Peter came back to this land. He will, we imagine, if he comes in with a state, depending on your theology. But, but if he comes back, and he comes here, he, know, he, he hears about this place. Hey, Peter, we got a statue about your sin. I don't think he'd want to come here. Just imagine if you had a, if, if, imagine if when you sinned, they put up statues. You know, a statue of you cutting off that person on the road. Or a statue of you losing what you do at home with your family when you lose it. You know, a statue of that. Or a statue of you, of you, uh, you know, you uh, cheating on your tax. A little statue of that, you know. It would be embarrassing. It'd be terrible. But yet, this is a holy place. This is a holy place. I mean, with a statue, it's a holy place. Not because of the statue. Why? Because when we look back at our lives, and we see even all the times we have disappointed God, it is holy because God's love is bigger and greater still. Because even though Peter disowned Messiah, the Lord, the Lord did not disown Peter. That's it. And so it was the, it was the Lord's love that overwhelmed Peter's sin. And it was in Peter, it's like Gomer, the, the, the wife of Hosea, who sinned and sinned. At the end, he redeems her, and you get the sense she's never going to mess up again in that way. Because the, even, the point is that even when we disappointed God, the point is that even when we denied him, even when we, we, we failed him, even when we grieved him, he did not disown us. And that knowledge, that love, that revelation is enough to change us, to make us. We are. So all these places become holy because of it. And so that the, when, the, when we who are unfaithful, yet he's still faithful in our unfaithfulness, we start becoming faithful. In love, in gratitude, this is the Mary Magdalene part. This is Peter. This is, this is, this is all these ones. You let the love of God overwhelm you because this is not about us. It's about him. And when we get past ourselves and break out, it's not about us. It's about him. We start becoming who we were meant to be. We cannot change the love of God, but the love of God will change us if we let it. Amen? That we could live a life of love in gratitude to God. That's what it's about. That you let your, this is God's gift to you. Let your life be your gift back to God. God called each of us on a journey. Some of you were called here. You knew it for you wanted it your whole life. Some of you was last minute. But God called us all here. That's why we are here. To change you. To, 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 to touch you. To get through that to your heart that when you go back, you're going to be different. Let that happen. Let's take a moment. Let's, let's do a very important prayer right now. Let's close our eyes. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for this time. Thank you for your love. We, thank, we cannot thank you enough for you. And Lord, we ask you would touch each one. Help us to live the life you've called us to live. And we just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that your love is greater than our sins. Your love is greater than everything we, we disappointed you with. Your love is greater. And Lord, that is, that is so great that, Lord, it will even change us to please you. In grace, in love, that's how we can do it. So, Father, we thank you so much. Lord, we lift up any regret, we lift up any guilt, we lift any shame, we lift up any any barrier to you, any hardness of heart, any disappointment, any unforgiveness, any anything that has that has hardened us to you, anything that's put a wall between us and you. Father, and we want to just please you and we want to just live in your grace and live in your love. Let your love come in in every way. And while we are in prayer, stay in prayer with you and God, but while we are, if <clears throat> you are here and you have not fully made your peace with God, if you have not been born again, or maybe you have been and you've kind of fallen away, but you haven't been right, whatever it is, it just ha you haven't been living victoriously, you haven't been living in the will of God, you know it. Whether you are not born again, doesn't matter if you're Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, whatever you are, doesn't matter how good or bad things have been, we all need this, it doesn't matter. He didn't say you're to be religious, he said you must be born again. 
There's only two roads. One road leads to heaven, the other leads to hell. Heaven is God's will, hell is not. But that's there. If you're not born again, you're on the wrong road. That's why he gave his life. If God could have, he loves you so much, he would even take hell for you if it would save you. And the fact is he did, and that's why we're here. And so God is calling and saying, this is the time, now. It's heaven or hell. And he said, you have a heart. how long do you have to make this decision? You have one heartbeat, because that heartbeat can stop at any moment. That's a gift from God. Your life is a gift that's precious from God. And that heartbeat can stop, and that's the end. Then it's eternity. There's no more ch chance to make that choice. But that take that heartbeat as God knocking on your life and saying, open up. I love you. I will not reject you, but I'm calling you. I'm calling you by name, or I'm calling you back by name. But come. Now is the time. There is no other time of salvation. That's why the Bible says now is the time. How? It can start with a simple prayer. If you'll meet it in your heart. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. If you mean it in your heart, to simply say yes to God, yes to his calling, yes to his voice. He will not reject you, but don't miss the moment. Here it is. The Lord is passing by just as he passed by the apostles in Galilee. And here's the moment. Don't miss the moment that God is calling now. So you're, he, the greatest blessing is waiting. And don't fight it. God is calling. Let's pray right now. I'm gonna, we're going to pray. The Bible says, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. You can say it in a whisper. But say it. Pray along with me. Whether it's the first time you have not been born again, or whether you've known God, but you've, been, you've kind of fallen on the side for something, or something happened, caused you to stumble, or maybe you just haven't been living in victory, what, or maybe God is just calling you, and you haven't answered a call while we're here. Pray with me right now. We'll, we'll tailor, the, tailor the prayer to you, but let's, let's pray together. Just repeat after me in a whisper. Wow. See, the time is late. Make, what a sign that is. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. The heartbeat. Let's pray. Just repeat after me. The Lord calls you. Lord God, I come to you now, and I say yes to your calling. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for coming here and giving your life for me. Thank you for dying for my sins and overcoming death so I could be saved. And I say yes to your call. Thank you for calling me. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for loving me. I say yes. I'll follow you with all my heart. I'll live as your disciple. I will walk in your footsteps, not only here, but when I go home me on. Wash me, cleanse me, make me new. I turn away from the old, I turn away from my sins, I turn away from the dark, and I turn to the light. I'm following you, and I'm going to live a life that to please you. Thank you, Lord. I receive your love, your peace, your cleansing, your presence. And I make you Lord of every part of my life. Lead me on from this moment and all the days of my life. In the name of my Redeemer, Jesus, Yeshua, my salvation. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations. Listen, but don't let it just be a prayer. Let it be the beginning. Tell other people, start living it. But it's a perfect time here. And, and as we as we come to the end of the journey, it's really the beginning of a journey we go back home. Amen? All right. It is on to the garden tomb, to the resurrection. I don't think we have to.